actually the candidate or is it just the macro threat? Because you could predict this like with a good amount of accuracy. There are models that predict these things with really good accuracy, a year, like years before the actual election, even before the candidate is chosen. So mm -hmm. sometimes it kind of is like how much of it is actually our choice? How much of it is really determined by uh, the people and how much of it is just determined by history? Well, I think a lot of that also is also determined by you know how the parties you know print out the candidates. If I think if Trump ran against Obama in two thousand eight, he probably would have lost. Hmm. Yeah, it is hard to say, but let's just say that the the result of the uh, presidential election was kind of surprising. <coughs> okay, you know, it was not expected. And remember what I said. It had nothing to do with me going to Canada on on <laughs> tomorrow, Thursday. You brought this whole thing. <laughs> 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 it's just a coincidence. Complete coincidence. And I because you know if it is not a coincidence, that means you know because if you check my flight tickets and all that stuff, it was all done in August. Wait, but you said that you could figure it out from from like two years ago. So well, I only watched that you know from uh, from news uh, yesterday. So so it wasn't. It wasn't are they able to be canceled? Hmm. That's really the question. You could have landed out in August and just canceled. <laughs> Make sure everything is cancelable, right? So you're gonna start becoming an online teacher. Ah, okay. Yep. <laughs> well, I guess you know we can uh, change our app here. This is due today. Okay. So, are there any questions regarding the homework assignment? Let me turn on the projector. You guys can see what I'm talking about. Any questions about the homework assignment? No. Was it difficult? Easy? <coughs> Easier than the first one because you only have to do modifications. So, you know, if you, it depends on whether you, you're going to use my code or your own code, because if you use my code, you have to figure out where to make the changes. Yeah. And that can be a little bit more challenging, because now you have to understand the logic of my code. Okay? All right. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is, you know, I do want to kind of play with uh, Firebase DB. I want to show you guys how to use Firebase DB. So the question is, how can we test it when we only have one simulator. Hmm. So we need to run at least two simulators or emulators in order to test the feature or one emulator and, and an actual uh, Android device because we need two installations running at the same time in order to see, oh, okay, I updated the, the Firebase DB and here is the other one, it's getting a notification, it's getting an event of th something is getting changed. Okay, so today's class is gonna be focusing on that part because you know, I think some of your apps, okay, because I reviewed um, the pro project proposals, and some of your apps you know, can actually make use of Firebase DB. So I do want to kind of make sure that we know how to use Firebase DB. Yep? Well, um, is there an advantage to using Firebase DB instead of TinyWebDB? Um, that's a good question. We'll look into that. Yep, go ahead. Um, that was originally Firebase DB was Share it across a user's account, it's not across a user's account. Because you were talking about using it with multiple users being able to get updates. Right. So it's not, if you can give it one code across many users or one instance, I guess, or reference to. It's over all users. So every single installation of your app is accessing the same database. They will have access to exactly the same tags and the same values for the tags. And that's because you give all of the application installations the same Correct. Firebase code. Yep. Mm -hmm. And you can change that too. It's a property. So you can make multiple apps, different apps, to use the same Firebase DB. So that makes it possible to, let's say you were, you're dealing with the tutor versus the 2T you know, application. So you can make two separate applications, one for tutors and the other one for 2Ts, and they both access the same, same database. Yeah, so it is entirely possible. Okay, so getting back to here, we want to take a look at the, the two things, okay, that, that are supposed to be equivalent, is Q. 
want to use this one. All right, so we'll. Okay, so this is okay because we are just looking up the uh, description here. <clears throat> and let me see, is the recorder on? <coughs> yep, okay. <coughs> All right, so we go to connect. Okay, one is under experimental. We logged into Firebase DB the previous time. The other one is under storage. Yep, tiny web DB. And here's TinyWebDB. Uh, TinyWebDB only has a surface URL as the only property of this particular thing. And it has considerably less features in, because when you look at the blocks, they are all different. Uh, there, there are fewer of these blocks compared to Firebase DB. When you look at the methods, it has got a got val get value and a store value. And then the events are corresponding to the asynchronous nature of the methods. In other words, every time you use the block and get value, it returns immediately after sending the request. But the actual reply, when the actual reply comes back, you're going to have a got event, um, got value event, to indicate that okay, whatever you asked for earlier is now here. Same thing for value stored, which is an event that happens after you make, after you use the block store value. Okay. And then the other one is just for error handling. So in this case, um, the description of TinyWebDB is a non-visible component that communicates with a web surface to store and retrieve information. So let's go ahead and use this component. Okay, we drag the component in. And look at the surface URL. So the surface URL is really just uh, app inventor tinywebdb.app and I think that may not be the entire thing. Let me see. Dot appspot.com. Okay, so this is one single URL, and of different applications, it's going to use exactly the same URL. So the question now is: Is it specific to a installation of your app, or is it you know, global to all apps? That becomes the question. So we'll test it. Okay, we'll test that and see whether it is across all apps or is it really just specific to one particular installation. Because there are three possibilities here. It was not made clear which one of the three possibility this applies. The first one is it is just like TinyDB except it is web-based. In other words, what you're storing is specific to a single installation of your app. Okay? That, which, is, which makes it the same thing as a tiny DB, except it's web based. The second one is it is specific to your app. Okay, so all installations of your app will access exactly the same thing. But when you're dealing with different apps, they will not hook up to the same database. The third one is it is universal. Okay, it doesn't matter what app you're dealing with, you're still accessing the same data. So are we okay with all the, the three different scenarios? Yep. Is this just like Firebase where there's a company managing the site that you're going to, or is this? There's a company managing the, managing the site for sure, but what is hidden away that we cannot really see is the underlying representation of this component. Because it is possible that this component is, is using some kind of ID that is unique to your device to say that, okay, these things are specific to only this device. That will make it equivalent to a tiny DB because it is, it, it's installation specific. But it's also possible that the underlying you know, representation is on a per app basis, which means you know, all installations of the same app would have access to the same data, okay? But if, you, if it doesn't have anything that is hidden, then it becomes you know, global to all app inventor apps. Every single app <coughs> inventor using the tiny web DB would basically end up using the same database. So those are the three possibilities. So now we need to differentiate which one it is. So did you do any experiments to find out which one? No, I just went right into making my own and not even dealing with the shared one because it says something when you go to that page about mm -hmm. there's a maximum of 500 entries and if somebody overwrites, it'll overwrite the last one. 
So that that tells me it's global, like you know, across all apps, which makes it not exactly usable. <laughs> Other than just for testing and just playing with it, it's not usable. Because if you use something that is like common, like ID or history or something like that, you know, chances are you somebody else is already using it. Right. I mean, I don't know if it's just if they just have a, a number limit and they're, they're still unique, but once it fills up, if it starts deleting the oldest one, or I don't know how that works. But. Okay. So let's let's. <laughs> well, I think this part kind of tells you that you may not want to use this. The demonstration web surface is designed to work with App Inventor for Android and the Tiny WebDB component. The site is designed for use by applications running on the phone via JSON request. You can also invoke the get and store operations by hand from this web page to test the API and also to delete individual entries. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. Let's uh, let's go let's do a get value. Um, okay. The server will send this to the component. So the value of test is nothing. Okay. So let's try something. Did you use any particular tag? No, I, I didn't even. I didn't even touch that default one. Okay. Um, I'm just you know, testing all the common ones. Okay, let's go ahead and store something too. So let's say the you know, test has a value of twenty three. Store the value. And then we tried it back. Uh, test. Get the value. It is twenty-three. Okay. So this should be completely independent from the from any app that is doing the same thing. Is that okay? So I'm gonna write a very tiny little app to run the app to store something and then try to retrieve it on this side. Okay? And and possibly vice versa. Yep. So we don't know where this went page how it was identified on the other side really. you know, that is correct but we can test it you know once we actually write it write an app to test this I think we can have a pretty conclusive answer in this case okay so we'll go ahead and make a new app okay we can say it's test web tiny tiny oops web db And then we'll hook up a tiny web DB to it and give it two text fields. <coughs> text box. There we go. And give it two because you know one for the key and one for the value. Um, and then just have a store. There we go. In the blocks, we'll specify when the button is clicked. We are going to store the value. We'll use the first one as the tag. And then use the second one as the value. There we go. Okay, so. Let's give it a try. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, are you then going to go to the website to retrieve it, or how are you going to retrieve it? I'm going to retrieve it on the on using the browser. Okay. So I would use the browser to retrieve because you know if I can do it th like this, it means you know everything is it's truly universal. In other words, it doesn't differentiate between devices or even apps. You know, every single app inventor app is using the same. They're all using the same tags. So unless you come up with a very ingenious way to kind of create names that are not likely to generate collisions, which is possible, okay? You know, just just use whatever string you want to use and do MD5 hash. <laughs> so this is one place where MD5 hash is okay because it is not, uh, you know, <laughs> exactly. All right, so we'll give it a try. Um, let's go ahead and uh, start up a emulator. Okay, so we say Android Studio bin Studio.
Now, ambiguous description of stuff is not unique to App Inventor. Even in Android documentation, sometimes you know, things are actually ambiguous as well. So the ability to test you know, things that are ambiguous and find out exactly you know, which one or how it works is actually important. So let's start this. And then in the other one, I'm going to start up ADB. So Android, oh, we got, we got one window already there. So we can just say ADB uh, devices. There we go. So we got connectivity, and we should be getting the app here. Oh, I didn't ask you to build. There we go. I have a pretty strong suspicion that it is going to be the same. So it's a true, truly universal resource across all apps, which basically means it's not too useful. There we go. All right, so we'll install the app here. Test tinywebdb.dbk. <clears throat> so now I go to the app in the emulator under test. Okay, there we go. And just give it a particular test. Um, I'm just going to use something that is fairly unique. <laughs> there we go. And it will give it a value of 45. Okay, go ahead and store that. Okay, ASDF, basically the entire middle row of the keyboard. So now we go back to the browser. And go to get value. And we got it back. <laughs> so there we have it. So I think that pretty much is conclusive. You know, all apps, all installations share the same single database. From every user? <coughs> From every user. <coughs> so this is truly universal. Okay. So given that, are you still going to use it? Well, since I already have my own set up, I might just use my own. I was just wondering if you know of any like features or advantages okay. that might sway me into using Firebase DB instead. OK, but, but this is a pretty clear answer to that question as well, is you know, tiny web DB is not really usable because it's not specific to your device. It's not specific to your application. It is global. It's just It applies to everybody. Right, but I, like, I have my own custom URL now. Okay, so cool. So when you case, have your... It would be unless somebody else happened to find my URL. Yes. And it was kind of a pain to do, so I wouldn't recommend it unless you wanted to frustrate yourself. Okay, so that question is now answered. So now we can kind of go back to the original thing that I was planning to do, which is to test the uh, the operation of Firebase DB, okay? Because Firebase DB, you know, seems to have a lot of really useful features. So we'll say test Firebase DB, and we'll start with something simple, okay? And we'll go ahead and start with the same thing, okay? We'll have two text boxes. And we'll have two buttons. Okay, one to store, and the other one to retrieve. Okay, and it's better to rename these names. So this this is for specifying the tag, and this is for specifying the value. This is for storing, and change the actual text the store and then the other one is for retrieving or getting so we name it to get 
and then change this text to get as well. All right. So now we have a really simple app, you know, to be able to store, to get, and really not a whole lot more. Okay. So it's time to program the buttons. Okay. So we go to blocks, and we start with a button click, which is. Well, let's do with the uh, the store first. So here, store. Okay. So when store is clicked, I'm not even going to bother to do any error checking, and I will go straight to storing the stuff into Firebase DB, which is under experimental. Okay, fine. Okay. So when you look at the Firebase DB, you know you have to take a look at. Um, the properties, and this is considerably more properties than the other one. Firebase token is something that you really should not change unless you have a very good reason, because this one is specific to um, this is specific to all App Inventor apps. Okay, it, because it's it's already set up. It's a service that is already set up, and the service I think is offered by Google. So somebody already went through all the trouble to set up a database. So you should not change that. Uh, Firebase URL is the same thing, you know, just use the default, you know, just leave it alone, don't change it. Um, persist, hmm, I think we looked into persist once, yeah, I cannot remember what it is, but this one is important. Project bucket, okay, this is how you can write multiple apps to share the same Firebase DB. So if you make this one unique and you use the same one across multiple apps, then multiple of your apps can get to the same database. <coughs> yep. Is that settable in code in the blocks? I believe so. So when you go to blocks and you go to Firebase DB1, you can go through its properties and see which one is changeable. So project bucket is the only property that you can actually change in your blocks. So if I want a subset of people who installed my app to share something and another subset, I can have the dynamic yes. change. You can have it dynamically change inside your application, which can be handy. Okay, all right. So getting back to the designer, I just want to remember re, uh, know what persist means. And so we go back to designer, go to the help screen here, and just look for persist. It's designer only. If true, variable will retain the value when offline and the app exits. So it's basically, do we want a local copy? I think that's basically what persist means. Okay. Um, values will be uploaded to Firebase the next time the app is run when connected to the network. This is useful for applications which will gather data while not connected to the network. Note, append value and remove first will not work correctly because there's no way to guarantee atomic operation. If you set persist on, on any Firebase component, on any screen, it makes all Firebase components on all screens persistent. This is a limitation of the low-level Firebase library. Also be aware that if you want to set persist to true, you should do so before connecting to the companion or incre for incremental development. Now we are not doing anything with the companion for incremental development, so it doesn't really matter to us. So the bottom line of per persist is as long as you're not using um, append value and remove first, okay, it basically maintains a local copy of those particular tags. Okay, so if you, so you can, so when you connect to the network, it will have all the tags in your quote unquote downloaded. So when you're offline, you will still have access to those particular tags. And when you update those tags, you can update it locally. The next time you hook up to the network, it will, it will then update the web-based version. So it's all managed automatically for you. That's with persist? That's persist? with persist. Okay. Now without persist, it means without networking, it just won't work. You cannot get value, you cannot store value without persist. Now, on the, so with persist, you can do so without network connectivity because when it does connect, it will do all the updates. Okay, okay. all right. What if you have two users, both offline? Then will it be time managed? Nope. They will because it says right here append value and remove first do not work in this case. So that means you know the database will only keep track the last change. Okay. 
So what, whoever gets the last store is storing the actual value, or it will clobber the earlier um, store. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and move ahead and write our app here. Okay. So when we click, you know, uh, store, we're gonna do do a very simple thing and just tell Firebase DB, go ahead and store. So in this case, we go to um, store value, and we already know this is the tag. So the text of this is the text, and I'm, I'm just gonna be lazy and duplicate it, just change the uh, text box here. So this will start the operation, but it doesn't get it done until a little bit later. So in order to indicate whether it is done or not, I'm going to disable the button until it is done. So I cannot click it again until it's done, which kind of makes sense. So over here, I'm gonna go to button store and disable, okay, enable is up here, and disable the button. So visually, we should see something as well. Because when you set enable to false, you will actually see the button being grayed out. You cannot interact with it anymore. Okay. But as a result of this store value block, eventually, as long as I have network connectivity, it will be done. When it is done, it will give me a no. Oh, it doesn't actually do it. I should get a data changed. Maybe, maybe not. This is actually a good thing to test. Because according to the list of event handlers, it has got data changed, database Firebase error, first removed, which is not what we are requesting, got value, which is not what we are requesting, and tag list, which is also not what we are doing. So we are simply trying to store a value. So I'm suspecting that the event that will happen is data changed. Okay, so we'll see whether that is the case or not. So we'll go ahead and re-enable the button. But in here, yep. Yep. It will it will trigger this also in all. Trigger. Yep. Okay. Which also means you know I should not just blindly you know re-enable the uh, the button because all the other apps would also run the same code. Right, because you know, the other apps you know, may not have um, requested a, at a store, but they will get a change notification anyway. Right, and then button will change. But why would their button be disabled? They wouldn't be disabled, but if they were disabled for another reason, for another reason. then this will enable the button mm -hmm. that is unrelate, unrelated to the reason why they were disabled in the first place. Okay. So, so this. Right, so this may not be the best approach, okay? And then on top of this, we can also use um, a notifier to basically say, okay, we got this, okay? So we'll go ahead and use a notifier for this purpose. So we go to notifier and we use show alert because that's, you know, we don't need it to be very long. We just need to say, you know, a particular tag got this value. So we'll use a join operation <clears throat> just so that we can display the result. So we'll get this and specify the tag as the first item, the value as the second item, <coughs> and put an equal in between. So we'll put a equal sign in between. There we go. Okay. So we'll give it a try. Build it first, and I'm going to install this on my phone as well, so that on the phone I can do some changes, and we'll see whether the simulate the emulator is showing. Hey, this is now changed.
Okay, we'll set test as a tag to one. And it says, so it does have a notification of its own change, changes. Okay, so here is going to be the fun part. The fun part is I would install the same thing on my phone. And then I would make the change on my phone. And it should report back in the simulator that something is changed. goggles okay I'm, I'm still installing the app It's interesting that this it says you know this app does not require any special access, and then some of the other apps I think when we include the canvas, it would say that it in, it requires access to the flash drive. Haven't you guys noticed? Do you know why? Because the canvas comes with the ability to save its images, so even if you're not using that block, it has the ability to do it. So that's why you know, when you install the app, it will ask you, do you want to allow this app to save anything to the SD card? Okay, installing it, give, some, give, give me a little time here. And by the way, you can run multiple emulators too if you want to. You can just create new ones, but don't run the same one twice. That's not a good idea. Interesting. This one takes a little bit of time to install, unlike you know the the Canvas you know test program. This is a very simple program, but it's taking a long time to install. So I'm suspecting the the component, the Firebase DB component, is bringing in actually a lot of stuff because the app is actually bigger too. It's like two megabytes or so instead of just one. Yep. Okay. So right away, you know, I, I get test equals one even without doing anything. Okay. I just open the app. It says the test equals one. Because as far as this installation is concerned, it has never seen test. Okay. So now, now it, it knows. Okay, so I'm going to store something here. And we'll switch back to the emulator over here. Okay. So without, you, you, without doing anything in the emulator, I'm going to store, um, I'll update test to 2. Okay, so I'm storing a value of 2 into test, which is something that we already have. Click store right now. There we go. Now this can be very useful because you know it's almost instantaneous. The moment I press the store, that pops up in the in the simulator, in the emulator. Okay, now the question is what if I store a two again to test? Because technically speaking, it is not changing, but it is nonetheless a store. So would it classify as an update anyway? Because you know I just did something to it. Or would it figure out that hey, it's, not, it's the same value? It's no need. There's no need to notify all of the other apps. So that depends on whether the if it's triggered on a code event or whether it's triggered on like a, a hash or something to up the data. The actual change, right? Yeah. So I'm suspecting it will generate an, an event if I just click store again without changing the value that I'm storing. So click. Oh, it does not actually trigger it. So it really looks for the. It was an actual update, yep. yeah. mm -hmm. which is a problem because you know when that event is not triggered, my button stays disabled. <laughs> 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 so, which also means when you're storing, there's no, there may be no confirmation that it actually finished the operation. Is there a store? Was there a store method? There was no store. Method. There's a store method. There is a store method, but it doesn't have a doesn't have an event related to the store method. So it has a data changed, which is what I used to display the message. But none of these is going to be triggered as a result of storing something. You see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. 
that means you know once you once you execute that block, you know you you don't know you know when it is actually going to be stored, especially when your update is updating the same thing. It it's the same value as what is already stored. Right. So that is kind of interesting. I did not expect it like that. Okay. Um, all right. That's cool. So what else do we want to do with this? I mean, data change is really kind of useful. So yep. If someone Go ahead. is using Admin Manager and they have to use the key you used, which was test something, not key, bucket, uh -huh. then they're going to be hitting these alerts if they have a data change. That is correct. Okay, so we want to make that pretty unique, I guess. Yes. So you don't want it to be just like test or something like that, you know, because you know, the chances of somebody else trying to make your the project bucket name a test, you know, is pretty high. So you want to make it kind of really unique to your, you know, application. Um, possibly just use a hash function, a small, smaller, you know, hash function, uh, okay. to give you a kind of like a randomized, you know, pattern that nobody. Uh, it's unlikely that somebody else is going to use it. Because otherwise, yes, you know, because somebody else can just, you know, force the project bucket property to be something, and if, if it just if it so happens to coincide with yours, that other person will still be able to see what you have in your database. Yep. But you can change it too. Remember in blocks, you can change it in blocks, yeah. which means, okay, now don't do it. You did not hear this from me. Okay, as you know, uh, James Earl Jones said in the, the the hunt for Red October, I was never here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So you can programmatically use your app to test out <laughs> different project buckets, bucket names, to see if you can accidentally step onto somebody else's <laughs> five A's DB. Because it can be it can be changed using you know using blocks. So now we can just, you know. Make a dictionary run? Oh, sorry? Do a dictionary run? Like they do for yeah, do a dictionary or run, or better yet, okay? <laughs> Go to the gallery. <laughs> Go to the gallery, and, you know, because, well, with the gallery, it, it's, the source code is open anyway, right? You know, but you can probably tell from the project name, most people, if, if they don't change, um, project bucket, it's going to be the same name as the project itself. So when you look at those projects and you say, oh, this is something that seems likely to use a Firebase DB, you can just give it a try. You know, see if you can hook up to somebody else's uh, um, Firebase DB. But there's also something about this that I think you know, may not, it may not be that simple to hook up to somebody else's uh, project bucket. So I'm going to test this theory, okay? So the theory is behind everything, there's always that, uh, do, do you guys remember how we located the path to the TinyDB URL, not URL, the XML file? Do you guys remember that part? Okay, let, let me just kind of do that again. Okay, because it is, it is potentially relevant. Okay, so we'll go ahead and say uh, shell, okay? So I, if I remember correctly, it's under data data, and look at all these names, okay? This is already good enough, okay? Look at all these names. Um, the application that I installed, they're all under the name of App Inventor, which is replacing the com or the org. It is App Inventor, the dot AI for App Inventor underscore, and then there's my name, okay? There's the Adopter Tag 2016 fall, and then occasionally it's the wrong account because it's right here, okay? But nonetheless, okay, my account name that I use for App Inventor is a part of this specification. Is that okay? And then the last part is the actual name of the project. So if Firebase DB is making use of this, and not just, but it's not telling you, it's using this as a part of the identification of your Firebase DB, then you won't be able to use the same project bucket as another app. Okay, but that depends on whether the underlying implementation of the component 
makes use of this. Yep, go ahead. I think we looked at the tokens too in the, one of the first classes and found that they were different tokens for different accounts. But were they different? Yeah, look, go okay. pull yours back up real quick because I've got mine pulled up right now. Okay. Uh, EYGB, oh, maybe it's the same. What's the very, what's the end of it look like? That's the end, 5M. Okay, yeah, mine ends in KK, XU. Okay, so the token is different, which basically means you know, they are potentially different. But is it different on a per app basis or on a, on a per user basis? That's the next question. So to test that theory, okay, we just have to remember 5M here. We go make a new project, okay, um, you know, test two, test one, doesn't really matter. Because all we're going to do is to make a Firebase DB and compare the last two letters and see whether those are also 5M. So we go to experimental, drag Firebase DB, and look at the very end. It is JM in this case. So I'm suspecting this one does not see the other one at all. Okay. So we'll go ahead and change the project bucket to the same name as the other one, which is test Firebase DB, I think. Um, let me double check. Test Firebase DB, okay, uppercase DB, and test one. Okay, so it has exactly the same uh, project bucket. Then we go to blocks, and this time, you know, all we will we'll do is to use a notifier. Okay, put the bold notify in first. Okay, go to blocks. And this is the only thing I'm going to do. The only thing I'm going to do is to say when that is changed, display what is changed. That's all. So we go to notifier and use the show alert. It's basically the same thing as the other one. Um, use a join operation here. And specify the tag as the first one. The value as the last one. And we'll just put an equal sign in between, just so that we can separate the two text values. And this is it. This is the entire program. Uh, let's build this. So what, what I'll do is I'm going to run this test one program using the emulator. And then I'll use my phone to do the update and see if this one is getting the update. Okay. Yep. And if it doesn't, can we make the token the same? That's we. That's something we can check. No, the uh, the token is not updatable by blocks. Okay. So it's only updated once, or when you you can it can only update it in the designer view, but you cannot do it inside the blocks. Okay. And if I pass the uh, the AI, I, the other file, does that yeah. hold the token? It should be in there somewhere. Yeah. So we'll download test one, install it. Um, oh, we're still in the shell. Okay. There we go. Okay. Go back to the emulator, run test one. There we go. Okay. Oh, okay. It's the same. It, it's getting test equals two right away. <laughs> Even though the token was different. Even though the token is different. So it, it's it's definitely shared across apps of the same account. The same account. Of the same account. So I'm going to change it to three right now. Well, I can't do it because of my, uh, I have to back out and do it again because my, my button is still disabled. <laughs> because of, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, if you update it, oh, you can't update here. <laughs> but this can potentially be very, very useful when you want an app where you want multiple users to interact and stuff like that. Yeah, but if it's multiple users, they're all different accounts, right? Hmm? If they're 
multiple users in our different accounts? They're the same account because the, the account is based on your app. The account's based on your app, not on their, their phone. Not on their phone, no, their right. Because now I'm using a phone here, right. and the emulator has nothing to do with this phone. There's no, there's no relationship between these two, other than they're both Nexus 5. Okay, yep. so it's because the app that's shared loaded with the same phone. Before. Right. Yep, so I'm using test again as a tag, and I'm changing it to five this time on the, on the phone. So I'm clicking store right now, and that one's getting it as well. So, f uh, so we can confirm that from the same user, it still works, okay? So now we can test it across accounts in App Inventor, would that still work? In other words, what I'm trying to do is to figure out whether it is safe for you to assume that only your app can get to your Firebase DB. Can somebody <coughs> accidentally step into your Firebase DB and start to make changes? That's what I'm trying to find out, okay? So the quick and easy way to do that is to export this particular project. And, you know, downloads is fine, we'll just put it over there. And then what I need to do is to sign out and sign back in as another user. Okay. So let's go to App Inventor. And this time I'm going to use 2015 fall or 2016 spring. Okay, that, that one it has a lot of stuff in it too. Uh oh. go and it will import the project that we have just uploaded which is test1.aia and build it here <coughs> Now, if I don't do a single thing and I install this particular test one, you will see something that's kind of interesting in the emulator, you know, and I'll, I'll intentionally do that just so that you can see it. So I'm going to save this APK file, which is actually a new one to replace the other one that I have already downloaded. Switch back here and install test one again. Okay. All right, so now we go to the emulator and look for the program test one. Now the first thing you might notice is, hey, we're still in test one. That should not be the case. When you are installing an app, and that app is actually being run at the, at, at the time, when you install the app, it would actually close the app first to install a newer version to replace it. So the fact that this is still running test one after we install test one.apk means, hey, something is not the same as before, okay? This rate, what you're showing here on the screen is a different account. Yeah, so this one is from uh, Dr. Tarek 2016 fall, okay, as the developer of this app, okay? okay? So when I go back and look at the apps that we have installed, now we can see two test ones, okay? Because one test one is corresponding to 2016 fall, as a developer, and then the other one is corresponding to 2016 spring as a developer. In other words, two apps can, name, can be named exactly the same, but if they're coming from different developers, they were still considered unique. Okay, and that's why we see two test ones here. And obviously the problem is I, don't, I cannot differentiate which one is which one. <laughs> I, I have a Samsung Google Calendar and a Google Google Calendar app. Yep, yep, that's, that's what happens. You, there's also an open source version of all the Google tools. So they're not published under you know, the Google name. It's, it's published under their uh, kind of the, op the more open source name. So you can actually have confusion with that as well. Okay, so let me see if I can drag it to find app info. Okay, this is the first one. So when you drag it into app info, it will tell you who, well, it should tell you who's the developer. No. 
It does not tell me who, who wrote this app. That's uh, not useful. Okay, we can always just uninstall both. Okay. Is that a date? Um. Yep. Well, it says you know since November ninth, you had used you know that many. Yeah, but otherwise, it's not telling me. Well, it doesn't seem that way. Some of these are clickable, so I can guess. I guess you know, click on some of these. Mm, nope, that's, that's just you know, how much space is used. Notifications, nothing special here. Mm, mm, nope, nothing that I can really tell from here. So we'll we can always just uninstall everything. <laughs> And uninstall the other one too because I cannot diff. Ah, okay, long click. Okay, click and just uninstall. And then we go back and reinstall from here. Okay, so this one that I'm reinstalling is from 2016 spring as a developer. Okay, it's done. We go and back. It has a different Token and the same, and a different, but a different developer as well. Different developer, different token, but the same. Uh, Maybe the same token. I think it might have the same token as the other one. Okay, so it's not popping up anything, but that can be because of any of the two reasons. Okay, because it may not pop up any notification right away because it is disconnected from the other bucket. Okay, so it's, it's not getting anything. It can also be because it is connected to the other one, except it has seen that update already. So to differentiate which one is which one, I'm going to update it now. Okay, so I'm going to update test to six on my phone. Now the the one running on my phone is developed by Doctor Tech 2016 Fall. This one is developed by Doctor Tech 2016 Spring. So when I click store here. I get a notification here, but not over there. And I didn't change a single thing. I did not change the uh, the first one, the first field in the designer. Okay. I did not change. Oh, where is that? I did not change the token. Do you have Do you have blocks on this one also? Huh? Do you have any blocks on this one? Yeah. But did you develop on this user? This is imported from the other one. You don't, you don't have any of your store buttons or anything on this one? No, nope, just like the other one. The other one didn't? Oh, no, no, no. I, I developed two apps. Remember, I developed a program called Test Firebase DB, okay. which has all the text boxes and the buttons. So that one can store, which is what I am running on my phone. Okay. And that one was, was developed by Fall. Okay. This one was also developed by Fall, but I exported from Fall and then re-imported it into Spring. So what does that one have for, for blocks? For, you mean for blocks? It just has, uh, oh, just that, okay. Yeah, it, it just looks for updates and say, okay, you know, it is updated or not. And can you show the end of the tokens? Um, sure. This is com this is entirely different. Okay, so what if we take the token and match it? But we already tried. Oh, you mean try to match this one with the with other one? Yeah, with the one that's on your phone. Make the token okay. the same, and you have the button the same, but different developers. We can try that. I don't think it would it would change it though. So you think I would. It has to do with the path of the. Yes. You think that's part of the. Yeah, I think that's game. part of it. Yep. So I'm going to sign out of this one, and then sign back into the fall one. Right to get it. Yeah, we'll just paste it into a notepad. So we'll use test one because they're both test ones, right? Right. right. <clears throat> so in test one, we go to Firebase DB one and copy this, put it into a little notepad thing. There we go. This one ends with J9, just to double check it is, oh, no, 
copy and paste. Oh, and do <coughs> paste. That is interesting. It looks like concatenation of some kind. You know, there's here's the J9. Oh, maybe that is what you're looking at on the dot your user dot whatever. Oh, that's 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 because I used two different methods to, to get it. Okay, switch to mouse pad, paste. So that's, I think the difference is if I double click, it only selects the first portion, but when I use the drag motion to select the entire thing, it actually got to the, 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 the whole thing. I used uh, home and end and shift. Mm -hmm. Shift and put it at the beginning yep. and then shift end. And yep. you can. Yeah, but it's different. Okay, so so this is the one that we want to copy. Okay, so now we have this one. We sign out of this again. <laughs> sign back into the spring. And go back into test. Does it go to, yep, it goes back to it right away. Uh, go over to here and before I destroy this I am going to copy this into mouse pad as well okay just so that we have a copy of what it was okay so this one is different it has a dash and that's why it wrapped around onto the next line yeah this one ends with a T8 they are different, for sure. They are different. I'm just looking for the first byte where they are different. So we see some differences here already. Okay, a lot of differences. Differences. Just some sort of hash too. I think it has multiple parts of a hash, and you know, I'm suspecting the first part of the hash is based on the name of the app itself, and the other part is based on you know, the developer. So that's why you know you see the first part being exactly identical, but then the other part is not. Okay. So now that we have captured this one, we're gonna go back here, copy this entire thing. <laughs> you, you can see how much I'm enjoying doing this. Okay, paste into here and um, regenerate the app. Having a strong interest to figure out you know, these things, like differentiating between, okay, does it work this way or does it work that way, is an integral part of being INTP as a personality type. <laughs> okay, go back to here, reinstall. And this time it should close the app and then because you know we are yeah, it it closed the app first because it is the same it's coming from the spring account. Okay, so we start this up. And it should display nope, it's not displaying anything. It should if it's already, if it's hooked up to the same database. So I'm going to update the test to 7 from here. And click store. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. <coughs> so you can have the same token, the same bucket, but it's a different yeah. developer. Yep. It, it just, there's no way you can hook it up to it. Okay. Okay. Good. Yep. So we. So it's, it's good, this is really, really good from the perspective of you don't have to worry about somebody trying to hack into your Firebase DB, okay? Now within your, your apps, your collection of apps, they are all interconnected as long as you use the same bucket name. But if you, but somebody else 
who is not using your identity as a developer cannot get into your Firebase DB. Which is really good because now you can choose which apps you, know, you want to use to share the same Firebase DB because they are collectively the same family of apps and which apps you know, should use their own distinct you know, Firebase DB because they're different. But you can't collectively develop unless you're using the same account. That is correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. This is all useful. Any questions? But this also you know, illustrates you know, how you can make the, um, the game that was due earlier today, right? How you can make that game kind of more of a competitive game because now multiple installations of your app, they can share the same Firebase DB. So people can now you know, use exactly the same map, the same dots, and compete for time, compete for distance, and then whoever you know has the shortest distance or the shortest time can have its name on the high score. And then halfway through you know, playing a particular puzzle, you can get a notification of, oh, somebody just solved this in <laughs> X many seconds. And then if your if your particular game has already lasted more than that many seconds, your your app can just tell you, just give up, you lost. There's no way you can you can make it to the high score. <laughs> Keep practicing, yes. <laughs> Little cricket, yeah. Keep practicing, yeah. Yep. There you go. But are there any questions about Firebase DB? Because you know we have just, I have just illustrated a really useful component. If you want your app to go across installations, if you want communication between installations of your app, this is a really good way to do it. Because you can do it offline. Remember what we did? We did some offline updates, and as soon as the app starts. It pops up and go like, "Oh, this is now updated." Right. So, updates. Yeah, you don't even you don't ask for, you don't have to ask for it. Right. Yeah, it can it can tell you that it has been updated. Yeah. Or it can do whatever it needs to do without even displaying. Yep. Change your local data. Right. Yep. Can you can you show us the blocks for the test again? Yep. I mean, we can determine that the bucket will differentiate. No, the, the other one. Oh, the other one. Yep, go so ahead. We develop, say we develop our project with our tokens and stuff and then submit it to you. Will you see, will you get a fresh database at that point? Or will I will get a fresh our, database. Yeah, okay. Yep. For grading purposes, when you turn in your final project using Firebase DB, I will get a fresh database. So whatever you have worked out up to that point is not accessible to me. Because when, unless you also turn in your own APK file. So if you turn in the AIA file, I can see the source code. But when you turn in your APK file, then I can actually run it and look at the what you have already developed. So when you, when you take the AIA, you're, you're compiling. You're because when I'm compiling, I become the new developer. But when you, but when you, if you also submit your APK file, then it's okay because you are creating the APK file. As using you as the developer. But the APK has already incorporated who created that app, and that is the determined. Yeah, and that is the factor that determined, you know, whether I have access to the database that you are using or not. So is that yeah, so it works exactly like the IDDB, pretty much. Um, Except for the, you know, it's shared. Yeah, but the data change is the, re is the really cool part. Because, you know, one, because you can have like, okay, let's say you're dealing with something like Pokemon Go, okay? So you have one app that is that has millions of installations. This basically means, you know, if somebody updates the database, then all those millions of installations will all get data changed as an event. They all say, that, oh, OK, something has changed, which is, in, which is really interesting in, on one hand. And on the other hand, you know, this will generate a lot of uh, 
network traffic as far as the server is concerned. But Firebase is a Google you know, service, so I'm pretty sure they can handle it you know, and uh, not be bothered. Any other questions? Do you guys see how you can potentially incorporate this into your own projects? Yeah. Can you remind me again, if we have the same development account and the same token, but our bucket is different, then it will not share the data. Right, so I think, you know, so far, you know, based on what we have tested, so let's say this is, this is the root, which is basically all app inventor stuff, okay? So within all the app inventor stuff, it is first divided by developers, okay? So in, in my example, I have one you know, fall account, I have one spring account. Okay, under the same developer, then it's based on bucket name. Okay, so we have uh, basically bucket one, bucket two, and so on. But the actual app is never a part of deciding which database you're connecting to. So which database you're connecting to is based on what we are dealing with App Inventor because, app, because Firebase is not only used by App Inventor, it's also used by you know, whoever wants to use it. And then it's based on your account, your, your developer identity. Based after the developer identity, then it's further refined by the name of the bucket. It's just that the, the bucket name by default is the same name as the project itself, but it doesn't have to be. So I really don't have to worry about the bucket being too original because I, me developer, knows how much what I develop. Yes. Okay. Yep. So, but I can dynamically change the bucket for a group of people. That so potentially, yes. Okay. Yep. Now I don't know for sure. You know, if you switch the bucket, does it automatically connect and give you all those notifications like right away? Or not. Okay, so I'm not really sure whether it is that part is dynamic or not. You can test it, right? You know, but to see if that if data changed actually. is whether you get a data change because you just switched buckets. Okay, but I can switch buckets and then make a call to get the data that way. Yes. Or a different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Very good. Any other questions? So now in addition to email for politicians, they also have to deal with buckets. <laughs> Secure buckets, yep. <laughs> you're, you're not the only one you know, with, uh, with a reaction to the uh, election results. I actually had one student you know, who uh, sent me an email and said that you know, he cannot make it to today's class or tomorrow's class because he needed two days to recover <laughs> from the results of the election. Ice bucket challenge. Hmm? Ice bucket challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and then it wasn't in this class, I think in the other class, you know, um, oh yeah, it was in the, in the class right before this one. Uh, one student told me that her husband, you know, uh, drank uh, heavily last night. <laughs> 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 Probably could not get to work today. <laughs> Yep. Any other questions about you know buckets? So I think this is probably a really good diagram, you know, because it first differentiates based on developers, and then under the same developer, it, then you can use buckets to help refine which project or which database you're connected to. It's, yeah, it is really good that it does differentiate the developer in the mm -hmm. sense that we now know our data is ours, right. right? We can be controllable. Yep. But it's not. It wouldn't be great for something that's across multiple developers that log in with their own. That is true. So in that case, I'm not really sure how to fix it. You know, unless you, yeah. unless you break into the APK file, then you might be able to kind of hack a particular attribute to make it connect. I wouldn't be surprised you know, if some people can figure out you know how to do that. I, it's just probably not built for multiple developers. No. Yeah, so if you want to complete this picture, you know, based on the same bucket, now it's up to tags to figure out what value you're getting to. But that part we know already. Yeah. Okay. Any questions about this stuff? No questions? Okay.
okay? I know this is not going to be, um, well, I'll say it anyway, okay? And by the way, we're going to have exam to next uh, to Wednesday. Uh, I, I, make, I was expecting more reaction. You guys go like, okay. <laughs> so we're going to have exam to next Wednesday. You know, we are gonna, just going to co cover stuff that we have done with the homework assignments, mostly just Canvas, sprites, um, making use of the timer. You know, that's a big one. Um, I think that's about it. I mean, you know, as far as homework, uh, aside, lists, okay, we also have to deal with lists, okay, that's a big topic as well. Are you going to give us a, a practice exam? Mm, how about this? Look at your homework assignment as your practice. <laughs> because that's going to be the same kind of stuff that's going to be in the test. Um, most likely, I will not ask you to start to write an application from scratch, okay. Um, there is a probability, there's a possibility that I will basically give you the base code and say, okay, you know, I want you to add these features to a program that is not a part of your homework assignment. Okay, so you have to read my code, figure out how it gets everything done up to that point, and then make changes to either modify the behavior, fix a bug, or add a feature to it. Okay, so depending on how many of those items you can complete, you get a score, you know, proportional to how much you can get done within the amount of time of the exam. That's one possibility. The other possibility is, you know, we just use a homework assignment, you know, such as the one that was due earlier today, as a, as a basis. And I just say, okay, add this feature to that homework assignment. Keep track of the high score. Keep track of the lowest time, you know, of the same, of the same dots, okay? You know, just keep track of the lowest the smallest, or the shortest amount of time to solve it, okay? Something along that line, okay? So there are different possibilities, but it will be based on what you have done with your homework assignments. I'm not gonna ask you guys to use Firebase DB to, uh, to design, you know, to place the dots collaboratively. Now that would be kind of interesting. You basically have people working on the same design so when one person say, I want to add a, a circle here, then all of the other people who are participating in the, in the same design will see that circle popping up. It's like, okay, you know, this project now has this one new you know, circle. And when you have all seven circles within the design, then it's done. But you can, co you can have several people collaborating to come up with that. Yep. What if we want to approve it first? Hmm? We want to all approve that circle. You can also have a vote button. vote button. Yeah, you can have a vote button. You can press on one circle, and you can vote, you know, whether you want it or not. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then instead of circles, we'll have heads of, you know, previous candidates. <laughs> there are enough of them. Exactly. There are more than seven, right? You know, all, that's all we need. <laughs> cool. You can also even make the game so they can play it collaboratively. So one person will handle the left, the other person will handle the right, right? Because you know, you potentially it can be done like that, okay? <laughs> but no, I'm not going to include Firebase DB in exam two, okay? So don't worry about that. But with Firebase, sorry, do we have a homework assignment? We don't have any. We have one due today, which is based on adding up the distances between the, the circles. And that was it. So we don't have any outstanding homework assignment at this point. Okay. Any other questions? No other questions? But I think this Firebase DB does open up all kinds of possibilities. A lot of stuff that was difficult to do is now easier, except for sharing files. Yep, go ahead. If you don't have the other topics in future classes, can we go over the location? There's a location function that allows you to Supposed to, I think, allow you to know where you are looking. Yeah, you mean um, the location sensor? Yeah, location sensor. Can you cover that? Yes. Yeah, um, I did it once. It was kind of like you know, okay, I showed you guys. Okay, this is. Oh, did you? Okay. Well, it, it but it was really, um, it was really just kind of like a, a mention, a very brief mention of it. Um, basically, with this one, the blocks associated with the location sensor, it's kind of interesting. The, the notifiers, the okay, events are the interesting ones. 
because you, you actually get to know and say, oh, my position has changed. Then you can respond to that event and go like, okay, what am I supposed to do at this new location? Um, you can also report back the address. In other words, it's, it's not really just showing you your longitude and latitude, but it can also show, show a street address. Now, how you can match a street address to the, where you're supposed to be, that's up to your code to decide. Uh, but it does have some you know, interesting features. So you can get, these are all the uh, ad, uh, properties. So you can get um, alt altitude, you can get latitude and longitude. So that's all just basically raw GPS uh, data. But you can also get the address, which I think is kind of interesting. So, so you can get the current address. And the distance interval is basically saying, okay, when should I get a notification that my location has changed? So when you make this like 100 meter, that means unless you have traveled at least 100 meters, you're not gonna get another event. So by making this smaller, there's no guarantee, but it's basically a suggestion to the component and say, if, I'm, you know, if I have moved like five yards or more, you know, give me another event. Yeah, I, I guess I was trying to use it to get the current address, but it would never show anything. I wasn't moving around. Maybe I have to move to get the event. There are two things you can change to um, affect how it updates your current address. So even in the designer, you can specify the time interval which is only also a suggestion, so it's never really guaranteed, but it's only a suggestion. It is also specified in milliseconds. So 60,000 is corresponding to a minute. Okay. So this is saying, you know, suggesting every minute, you know, it would give you an update. And then you can also have a distance interval, and it has, you know, all of these, you know, just set values in multiples of 10. Um, when you look up the help, I think these are all in a particular unit. I cannot remember what it was. So when you look at um, distance interval, these are all in meters. Yep. Not yards, because the rest of the world uses, they all use SI units. So I would like to see uh, President Trump to change the United States to use SI units instead of imperial units. Of course, the first question is, what are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, the, the difference between SI units and, and uh, SAE units is particularly a problem when you do circuit layout. Because traditionally, you know, circuits are all using imperial units. In other words, you know, you, we have pitch, like pin pitch of every, like, four pins for every one-tenth of an inch and stuff like that. So you, you have these you know, circuit layout programs that can basically have grids that are based on fractions of, a, of an inch. And then you have SI unit chips or that are based on SI units. Like, you know, the pitch is, you know, we have two pins every two millimeters or five millimeters. And because those two units do not really mesh well, <laughs> So when you do board layout, you know, no matter what scale you pick and no matter how, what kind of snapping you pick, somebody is not happy on the circuit board when you need components and some are metric units and some are, S, uh, some are metric units and the other ones are SAE units. Yeah, it's really bad because it's designed here and I'll build where the these are. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to uh, design circuit boards, so, you know, so I get 